The Consulting Success Podcast is powered by the Clarity Coaching Program. If you'd like to work directly with the Consulting Success team and receive personal coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, visit consultingsuccess.com to find out more and apply. Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky here, and today I'm with Shiv Narayanan. Shiv, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Michael. Super excited to be here. Yeah, uh, really excited to dive into your story. Uh, you're the founder and CEO of How to SaaS, a consulting company where you help SaaS companies. So for those that aren't familiar, software as a service is what SaaS stands for. Uh, you help them really to develop marketing systems to drive revenue growth. Prior to that, you served as the CMO of Wild Apricot, uh, which was acquired in October of 2017. You've grown your business now to, I think, seven plus employees or team members. Just before we record, you shared that in 18 months, which is kind of how long you've been having, running this business, you're now up to about $2 million in revenue. So that's uh, really great in such a short period of time. So I want to kind of dive into how you've done that. But you've also worked with some very well-established clients like Genstar Capital, TA Associates, Polaris Partners, and a whole bunch more. But before we kind of get to all that, I want to take us back uh, to kind of your time as a CMO at Wild apricot or apricot, however you, you say that fruit, you grew the company there or part of growing the company to about 20 million, I believe, in annual recurring revenue without a sales team. Is that correct? Yep. Without a sales team. You know, just take us kind of through that. Um, how do you accomplish that level of revenue without a sales team? Yeah. So my background is I started in the internet marketing world right out of school. In the internet marketing world, you sell ebooks, courses, et cetera, all through digital marketing channels and programs. And so when we entered the SaaS universe and Wild Apricot, I took over as a CMO. One of the things that I noticed is most of the SaaS companies in the world were going to market with a sales led model. Even today, when you look across even most B2B companies in general, sales led is the approach because the deal sizes are high, sales teams can target directly. And so that ends up being the go to market. But on the Wild Apricot side, we had smaller deal sizes. Our starting plan, if you're a small nonprofit, you can use Wild Apricot's all-in-one solution for about a thousand bucks a year. Um, and so with such a low price point, marketing had to be the primary go-to-market mechanism. And so as we started building that and the company started going and we would meet people, to us, it seemed like we were building something obvious and what was customary to in that situation. But we started hearing more and more about how unique that model was because of, we were using... Google ads and inbound and SEO and content and nurturing and Facebook ads. We were doing all these things before they were cool. And now it's widespread and people are starting to understand that this is how you go to market in a digital world, especially with COVID and when you can't do things like trade shows and traditional marketing. But when we were doing it, we were one of the first people to be doing it. And so that's kind of where the origin story for how to SaaS began, because as we started building that and we started seeing how unique it was, saw that as an opportunity to bring those same practices to other B2B companies in the form of a consulting model. Rachi, you know, have you always been passionate about SaaS? And this is kind of a bit of a two-part question, which is, you know, where does that passion come from? I mean, you mentioned internet marketing, so there, there is a bit of a connection, right, to, to SaaS and doing things online. So I wonder if, if that's it, if you could just kind of speak about that for a minute. But then the second part of that question is, you know, did you ever consider servicing, kind of taking your skills and knowledge as a marketer and as someone that knows how to really build a business and build revenue and help other types of companies that were not SaaS? Or was it very clear to you from day one, like, no, no, I'm going to build a company that really just focuses on software as a service companies? So software as a service is where we focus initially because that's where I've had the most success in my background. And SaaS was really exploding starting in about 2014-ish when a lot of companies started to emerge and we had been building Wild Apricot during that time. But now you see everybody starting a SaaS company, but back then it wasn't as common. So I saw that as a market opportunity and it was more of a specialization approach because there are a lot of marketing principles that overlap across e-commerce versus SaaS versus let's say you're going to manufacturing. But if you're thinking about SaaS in particular, there are some things that are unique to that context. I have advised e-commerce companies, you know, companies that sell, let's say, bone broth or weighted jump ropes and things like that that I've done in the past. But by focusing on SaaS, you can build standardized practices that help those companies better 
because it's a specialization. Did you ever feel a pull though to to take your skills and knowledge and let's say yeah, like also target e-commerce? Like a lot of I think this is this is a challenge shift that a lot of consultants have, which is you know I can help X, Y, and Z. You know why just only focus on X? Was that very clear for you? I mean, or did you ever feel like you were being pulled to have a bit more of a broader message that not only appealed to SaaS companies, but also to other e-commerce companies or other online businesses? I mean, that pull is constantly there. I think one of the hardest things in any business is saying no to revenue. When you have guaranteed revenue coming in or somebody that wants your help, the inclination is to say yes. One of the things that came about from building Wild Apricot and just being deeply embedded into business and strategy through you know high-level conversations and executive meetings and things like that is I'm a big believer in the Michael Porter line, which is strategies, not what about what you do, it's about what you don't do. And so for me, when I look at our business, yes, we can chase other revenue, but we constantly say no to revenue that's beyond what we specialize in just because it's not in our wheelhouse. And we even in our sales decks, we have a slide that says ideal customer profile. And it says you have to be above this much revenue. Your deal sizes need to be this. You need to have a marketing leader on staff, right? You need to be at this level of maturity. And if you're not, you're not a good fit for us. And we can definitely refer you to someone. And it becomes a disqualifier in sales meetings. And we lose some deals that way. But when we find the person that's an ideal fit, they know that they found the right partner as well. And is that like, so I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. And, you know, for someone listening going, yeah, that, that, that makes sense for you. You're established. You have 2 million in revenue. You know, were you also doing that? Were you applying that mindset even in the earlier days of the business? Or is that something that you now kind of feel like, oh no, you have the luxury because you've established a good solid base to build on? Even in the earlier days, it's actually, it comes down to building a differentiated position. So, I mean, what we sell is we're a marketing strategy consulting firm, specifically for B2B companies. And we work with high level investors that are buying and selling companies for hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So there are plenty of marketing agencies out there that can, for example, set up your Google ads for you. If that's the work that we try to chase, then we're going to be playing in a commoditized market. The way to win is by lowering your price. And as a consultant, that's the last place you want to be. You don't want to compete on price. You want to compete on value. And then price is no longer a factor, right? Because you want to be operating in high margins. So by starting there, we set ourselves up for success because, you know, it was painful initially because, you know, I quit my job. I left a significant amount of equity on the table, high paying executive salary with all the benefits of travel and a corporate card and all that stuff. And when you leave, you have these opportunities come to you and you're saying no to the revenue. And like, you know, I'm talking with my wife about it and she's like, why are we saying no to money when there's not enough business (laughs) initially? Right. But you're doing that because over the long run, you're going to build a better business that is more sustainable with a differentiated position. And as time goes on, you're going to, your margins are only going to grow because of that differentiated position. And that's hard to do. And every person's situation is different. Like I would say earlier on, if you're, let's say pre that situation, it's okay to take on some of that work just to keep yourself afloat. But the North star should always be to build that differentiated position. Yeah. I love that. That's really powerful. So your focus is on what you call a high performance marketing system for SaaS companies. Just take us through what does that system look like? What are kind of the different parts that make up that system? So again, like within the components, like we might still do things like demand gen across channels like Facebook or Google, but our differentiator is data. So when we are working with these large investors, when they're buying these companies for millions of dollars, what they want to know is I bought this company, I want to scale it. And the, my purpose for scaling it is at some point, I want to sell this company, whether through by going public or by flipping it to a different investor. And so I need to be able to use data to understand where are my levers to scale. And marketers just by default suck at telling that story or speaking that native language of data. So our framework is bringing data to that conversation and saying, here's where marketing spend is going. For example, you're spending $2 million a year on marketing. Here's the ultimate impact marketing made on revenue by channel, by campaign. Here are the opportunities to scale within that. And then here are additional items that have not been explored or experimented with that we'd like to attach budget to. And based on that information, here's our recommendation in terms of who you should hire, where you should scale your budgets and what it ultimately looks like in terms of your growth aspirations to decide how much budget you give to marketing. 
What percent of your business is, because it sounds like you really have two kind of sides to you or two parts to your business. You have the consulting where you work with SaaS companies, right? To help them to grow revenue and put that kind of marketing system in place. The other side is working with private equity firms, as you said, who are looking to acquire a SaaS business and want to make sure that their investment is going to be a good one by kind of looking for, you know, what are the assets in that business that aren't yet being fully utilized and can be improved to get or to create higher value. What percentage of your business right now is on the PE side? And what percentage would you say is more on the consulting side? So by going through, let me just rewind a little bit. So uh, when we sold Wild Apricot, we sold a private equity. And by going through that process, there's something called an earned thesis. And I think every founder needs to have an earned thesis. It's basically a secret or an insight about a market that most people do not have. So most marketing agencies have never been through an acquisition. So they don't understand all the stakeholders involved what's at stake, what a board meeting looks like, what a pitch meeting looks like when you're selling a company. So by understanding that, it opened up this market that is pretty much a blue ocean for us. And so we primarily go to market by focusing on private equity firms, or at least that was a starting point. There are a ton of people who go to market by trying to find startups or SaaS companies. We get inbound requests like that all the time. And many times those companies are too small for us. So we don't play in that sandbox. However, what PE is almost becomes is like a channel partner. They'll refer a big SaaS company to us. And then we work with the SaaS company as our client. So we've also built a go-to-market to say, can we by ourselves source deals from SaaS companies that are, let's say, doing 100 million in revenue? And how do we build our go-to-market on that side? Because that's our sweet spot. Because when you get to that level of complexity, there's just so much data to manage that you need to have like a high level strategic thinker involved to be able to figure out what to do with marketing next, right? And so that's our unique value proposition there. So it sounds to like what you're really doing is focusing on the P side because of your experience kind of going through that, that acquisition process when you're part of that previous company. And by going in and essentially doing that deep dive on their data from the marketing side and, and showing them and kind of sharing these new insights and then giving them recommendations, that's almost like your entry point. And I'm wondering... Do you find that then also leads to a lot of these PE companies saying, okay, yeah, thanks so much for, you know, all this recommendations and these insights. We're now going to go ahead and, you know, plan to acquire this company. And when we do, we want to bring you on and your team on to help us to actually, you know, implement on those recommendations. Is that what typically happens? Happens all the time. So in terms of our core product lines, I would say we have two. So one is like a full scale engagement where we're doing implementation and making a larger recommendation and that is roughly a four to six month engagement and then we have like two to three week engagements where we're just advising a transaction similar to the way you would hire uh, Deloitte to advise on acquisition on the financial side you would hire us to advise on the marketing side and due diligence on a specific target acquisition so we work on both of those and that allows us to get embedded into the PE transaction process entirely from end to end, right? And we're really their partner. And a lot of consultants or consultancies struggle with recurring revenue. Our model doesn't have that because an agency, for example, just charge you retainer monthly. Our model though, because we have the PE as a part firm as a partner, we have reoccurring revenue. So a PE partner might bring us into one investment or portfolio company today. If that goes well, we build a partnership. Next time they acquire a company, they're gonna call us. And so every year, the same PE firm is buying one, two, three companies, and we become just this part of their playbook and embedded into that ecosystem. How do you think about pricing or kind of what is your pricing strategy? Because you're talking about, you know, deal sizes here that could be tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And if the marketing, you know, strategies and campaigns that you identify are in that existing company, you know, aren't good, or there's some bad apples, or there's great opportunity, like, Really, the value that you're contributing, I think, could be very, very significant in helping that PE firm to decide whether or not to move forward and then how to best make use of that investment or how to grow the value so they can you know, cash out at a time down the road right, at a significantly higher valuation. So how do you think about pricing when you bring your team and you guys get involved? Is it on an hourly basis, a daily basis? Is it kind of like ROI or value focused? Just love to kind of know what your thoughts or what your strategy is when it comes to pricing. Really good question. So... The pricing part to me is connected to the product side and the product side is connected to understanding the market. So on the market side, like before we even got through the pricing is really understanding what are the things that are motivating these investors to be able to make the decisions? What are their incentives? 
what are the things that you know keep them up at night what are their goals dreams ambitions right so for a p investor or like just an investment firm in general you raise money from a fund people give you money to buy and sell companies when you buy a company you have to grow it if you don't grow it you're not going to be able to generate a return for your fund if you're not able to generate a return for your fund you're never going to be able to raise more money in the future so that's the connected cycle. So we get their incentive structure there and we want to bring them as much value as possible to help them be successful. Then when a transaction happens, there's a bunch of financial dynamics in terms of how money moves or exchanges hands. So by understanding those dynamics, being able to price in a model that gives them the right type of re leverage in the right stage. For example, if a firm buys a company or offers to buy a company, but the deal falls through, it's far more expensive for them to hire us than if the deal doesn't fall through. So we have contingency-based pricing that gives us a lot more upside once a transaction gets completed. So understanding those dynamics is critical because until we understood that contingency-based pricing component, our conversion rates on deals was lower for a due diligence engagement, for example. And then the last piece I would say is just the productization is we have those two offerings that I mentioned, but every engagement looks very similar. And that we're end to end, we have step-by-step -step what we're taking each company through and that's what we pitch during sales meetings. That's what's in the SOW. That's what's happening during the engagement. That's how we wrap up the engagement. And there are times when we're more perfect than others. But the whole point is that like the expectations are clear in terms of what we're selling. And then based on that, the price is based on the value. So it's never based on time. We actually don't bill by the hour. There's no mention of number of hours on an invoice ever. Uh, most of our engagements are pre prepaid. They must be because I mean, we're putting in hours into the engagement, but also just it's like you're buying a premium service and that's kind of connected to the positioning aspect of it too. Like you have this massive problem. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to you. If we solve it, that's what it's worth. And so you should be willing to pay for that. And so our pricing reflects that. So, I mean, our, our average deal size is at least 100,000 and it can scale up from there. While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step -step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. And so what do you say to, because I think a lot of people will be interested in this, when a new investor, someone that has not worked with you, a new P firm, let's say, or not new, but new in terms of working with you, says, well, you know, how long is this going to take? Like you're giving us a quote here, it's going to cost $150,000. Like how much time is this going to take? How many hours are you guys going to spend on this? What's your reply to that? Because you're not basing your fees on hourly, which is great, right? You're, you're more focused on value and ROI. What's your typical response to, to someone when that kind of question comes up? So I think in most cases, the question doesn't even come up because the, the, the stage has been set in a certain way that everybody understands the value that's going to come. So when we're going through the deck, like the price, uh, there is a transparent pricing slide, but I don't even pull that up until we've talked about the pain points, understood their business, tailored the presentation, talked about the productized offering, and then we're talking about the pricing. If it does come up, you know, my answer is, look, we're building a recurring asset for you here. And so we don't price based on time. In fact, some engagements, we might think it takes 80 hours and end up taking 200 hours. It varies. So it wouldn't even be the truth for me to give you an exact number here. But the whole thing that we're trying to drive towards is objectives. So management by objective. So the objective here is we want to build a system to drive demand. And for that, we need the data framework in place. We need to drive demand gen. We need to set a content roadmap, make recommendations on budget. And those are the outputs that you get. So 
that's how you measure whether or not you got the value back, not the time. And you can get plenty of people to work for you for more hours, but the number of outputs that we're giving out, you're not going to get that, right? So that's kind of how we position it. Got you. So let's talk now about how you've been building your business, you know, how you went about kind of getting clients. So you started this uh, consulting business about 18 months ago when you left your previous company, right? Roles as a CMO. What did you do right away to get the first, you know, couple of clients in the door? Yeah. So first few sales was directly to my personal network, people that had seen me speak, uh, people that we had pitched selling Wild Apricot to that knew my work or my quality of my work. And so we got a bunch of clients that way. Um, Actually, let, me, let me jump in for a second because I want to clarify because you're that sounds like a, a bit high level. Yeah, you know, just made it happen and then on to the next note. So let, let's stop for a second. Tell me, <laughs> yeah, sure. what do you do? Like, I mean, did you pick up the phone and call these people? Do you send them an email and say, hey, guys, like I've just left Wild Apricot and I'm now doing this. Just walk us through what you actually did to win those projects. So a lot of what I described in terms of the productization and market understanding and the dynamics and the validation that work I did before I started doing my outreach. And then step two was building a list of my people in my personal network to whom I could message that offering out. When I first messaged people back then, it wasn't as flushed out as it is today, like a full sales deck and the website and all that. It was literally an email to say, hey, person X, I left Wild Africa to start my own thing. Here's what I have in mind. I want to work with companies at this stage. Here's what I think I can help them with. Here's what an output would look like. Is this of interest? If yes, let's jump on a call. And so going from there, and then because people saw the value there, they would connect me with the company and you kind of go through that same pitch conversation. Um, what, what was the response like, you know, when you sent those emails out, like how many emails would you say that you sent out in total? About 40 to 50 initially. And what was the response? Like how many people do you think would you say actually responded back? Every person in my personal re- network responded. So, yeah, and I think... This is actually might be important for the audience of the episode here is I started building this business in a weird way in like 2016, because how does that start as a podcast in 2016, where I would interview folks and just for content sake, and I was putting it out into the, into the universe and that ended up building a lot of connections. And anytime any startup needed help, I would just give them free advice. Anytime there was a networking event or I met somebody, I would make an effort to just chat with them after. And so over time I had this huge Rolodex of people who were real legitimate relationships, not just like a a lead of a, or a business card of somebody's that I had. And so that is where, like, I would say the conversion rate on that was significantly higher where people were willing to invest into me because we had invested into each other's relationship multiple times over. Right. And so it seems easier than it actually is, but it took a couple of years to get there. Yep. So that's what you did is you kind of just activated the network and that got you your first few clients. Walk us through, I know you have, you know, kind of 10 or so steps. I don't know if we have time to go through all of them, but in terms of the steps that you've taken to, to build your business from, you know, zero to about 2 million in 18 months, what are those principles? What are some of those best practices that you think have made the biggest difference for your company? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we've touched on some of them, but I'll continue with where, you know, you said what happened after you got your first few clients. So when we got our first couple of clients, one of the big things was receiving customer feedback because initially I had some thoughts on what would be productized, but not entirely, right? And so as we had our first few engagements, our customers or clients would tell us, hey, I need this from this engagement. Can you add this to the statement of work? Can you add this? And then we would go through certain steps in the engagement and there would be like a output, like a presentation that was created or a spreadsheet. And it would be like, oh, we can templatize this and we can do this for more than one client. And you start to piece together based on customer feedback, what the productized solution looks like. And then once that's created, then you can put it in, in like a fancy sales deck and send it out to more people. So I would say that's definitely one piece is leveraging the customer feedback to improve product development. And thinking of, we almost market our consulting services the way we would market a SaaS company for a client of ours, because that's the go-to-market is almost identical. It's a professional services engagement, but we just you know think of it like that. And so productization and our pricing scales the way you would on a SaaS company's pricing page as well. Um, and so can, you, can you take us through, I mean, when you talk about the marketing piece of how you market your company and really also how you help others to market, because it is a, this kind of a similar go-to-market strategy, as you mentioned, what does that look like? I mean, if you're talking, let's say, to someone that is running a professional services firm, whether it was a PE firm or a law firm or a consulting firm or even a firm like your own, right? I mean, what are some of the steps that you think would be most important for them to take to, to start building a pipeline, to generate more conversations and, and attract 
more of the right people. Yeah. So step one is defining your ideal customer profile and who is the ideal type of person that would buy this product or service from you. And those should have characteristics, some type of demographics, psychographics, company size, whatever that is, understanding that very clearly and what offering you're going to present them with. Step two is mapping the market. And this is a step I think a lot of people skip. So for us, for example, I said private equity firms. One of the first things we did is we mapped every private equity firm in North America. We have every firm's website, all the people who work there, all their email addresses, everything. And all of that is uploaded into our HubSpot. So we invested in HubSpot the way a SaaS company would when we were a two-person consultancy. And we uploaded all of them in there. And then step three is based on that total addressable market is building a go-to-market against that. So I have one salesperson full-time reaching out to private equity firms and SaaS companies every day. Every time a company is acquired, we email the investors and we say, hey, congrats on the acquisition. Notice you bought company XYZ. We briefly looked into the marketing potential here. There's three to four things we can see right off the bat that we can do here. Let us know if you want to have a conversation. That's the type of an email that you would send if you were a B2B SaaS company. And But we're doing that for a consulting service. And every day- If your salesperson is your sole salesperson, are they in charge of doing that? Like, is that just kind of what they're doing all day, every day? All day, every day, that's their job. And I'm the closer on those conversations. So I'm the account executive, but I would say eventually the plan is to remove me from that process entirely. Got you. And is the vast majority of what your salesperson is doing, is it all email or is there also phone calls or video messages or kind of what, what does that look like from a tactical perspective? All email, all email. They will time to time, you know, look into the company and send specific data points for the company, but pretty much all email. Yeah. Got you. Okay, cool. All right. So you got a dedicated salesperson. They're kind of getting the, the pipeline moving for you, then jump on, take them through presentation, all that kind of stuff. What, what else? What else would you say yeah, has made a really big difference? So that's one channel. Channel two is events. Um, and obviously in the last few months, there haven't been many events except virtual ones. So we mapped out all the conferences where private equity for folks and SaaS executives would go and we messaged them to speak at those conferences. So we ended up speaking at a bunch before COVID started. So that helped and drove pipeline from there as well for us. And right now we speak at about two to three events a quarter. Third is paid media. We run LinkedIn ads. We're spending about ten dollars to $20,000 a month on LinkedIn advertising, targeting specifically private equity executives and CEOs of SaaS companies, driving them to a demo form. And then my salesperson almost like an inside sales rep handles those conversations. And then I get pulled in depending on the quality of lead. Can you just walk us through for a minute? Like when, so someone clicks on that ad, what, what is that ad offering? Like what is the call to action on that ad specifically? So the ad is a piece of content, usually something that's more native to the platform. And then it says, if you want to solve a problem like this, schedule a demo with us, uh, click here. And then that, that's actually on the, you mean on the landing page itself or in the ad? In the ad. Where it's, Okay. Yeah. So you have a piece of con. So the ad itself is a kind of a content based ad. And then the call to action inside the ad itself is, Hey, you know, if this resonates, if you'd like to chat about something similar, blah, 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 right. Go here. They then go to a page. And what does that page have on it? Cause you're targeting, you know, you're not targeting the typical internet marketing person who's, you know, buying like a, an ebook here or a course there. You're targeting a seasoned savvy executive, right? Which is what most of the listeners on this podcast and in our community are also focused on is, you know, people in organizations might be nonprofit, might be for-profit, big, small, but they're still kind of B2B buyers. What do you have on that form that's getting that person to actually fill it in and get in touch? What does that page look like? So, I mean, it's just our homepage, so people can definitely check it out, but it speaks in their language. So you won't see things like hire us and we'll do Google advertising for you. It's nowhere in there. It's more like increase the enterprise value of your investments. And here are case studies of private equity firms or their portfolio companies that we've worked with. And then there's a video of me speaking at a conference for private equity investors. That's right on the middle of the homepage. And then lots of examples. And then there's a bunch of data as well on the private equity market and the SaaS market that it's almost like it's an educational presentation that they're reading as they're scrolling through this page. But you're actually sending people to your homepage of your website. It's not to a dedicated landing page that you've orchestrate. It's just, and why do that? I mean, a lot of people I think have heard or believe that you need to send somebody to a dedicated landing page with not many options of navigation. And, you know, you want to kind of keep control of the flow. And at the end, a very, you know, intentional call to action or, you know, book a time call, any feedback or kind of reasons for doing it the way that you're doing it of just sending to the homepage. 
Yeah. So, I mean, just these kinds of tactical marketing things, like we don't think about at all because I mean, like things like button color and all that stuff, it's purely like you have a customer, they have a clear defined problem, speak to that pain, tell them how you can solve that pain and conversions will increase. And if your targeting on your advertising is correct, it will work. And in fact, having things like my podcast at the top, I'm working on a book right now, that's going to be in the navigation. All that only builds authority by keeping them in this airtight landing page. I never get to show any of that other stuff, right? So, and people clicking around is good at page depth on, on visits is actually a better thing. So we want more of that. Got you. So should we got yeah, a couple of minutes here before we got to wrap up. Are there any other big insights or experiences that you think are important for the consultants and consultant firm owners that are listening right now and watching to take in? Yeah, yeah, there's a few others I would definitely wanted to cover. So one is on the flywheel side. So just knowing what are the different drivers of your business. So for us, we look at four things. First is thought leadership and authority in the market. Two is building deep relationships with the market. Third is targeted sales. And fourth is client success. And so the way we look at that is like anytime we invest in any one of those four pillars, the flywheel keeps turning and the engine gets stronger and we end up closing more and more deals. So that's why we have a podcast, why we invest in the book, why we write LinkedIn posts organically, we'll get reach. Same reason why we build relationships and have targeted sales and have a rep to reach out to those people. So I think knowing that flywheel piece is super important. I think the one thing that we've been focusing on a lot lately is winning on brand. So the more content you put out there and the more affinity you build within a market, the sale should almost happen before this person jumps on a demo with you. And more and more we're publishing content to be able to get there. Every day I'm posting a daily piece of content, but beyond that, like building more authority pieces that can be leveraged for demand gen campaigns like LinkedIn ads, and then have nurture streams behind that, run a weekly webinar or something like that to get people more in love with the brand. And then when it comes time to buy, when they jump on a sales call, price is irrelevant at that point. So that's a, that's a very important thing that we're focused on. I got a question for you on that. So like, clearly you have a lot, a lot going on, yet you're pumping out a lot of content. Which, which helps, right? You're building that authority, as you mentioned, so it helps with, with pricing and all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of consultants have a challenge with that. Like, you know, they have so much going on that they feel it's hard for them to spend the time to create the content. Any tips, mindsets, just anything that, that you use that allows you, or habits, that allows you to still crank out lots of content, but, you know, do everything else that you're required to do in terms of working with clients and building the business? Yeah. So this was a challenge for me initially when I was a one person shop. And as we were able to scale, it became easier. Now I have a part-time person on staff constantly producing blog content for me. And then I personally write all the posts that go on LinkedIn. I use my iPad and I do something quickly. I spend about 15 minutes every morning creating that piece of content. The one tip that I'd say is essential is having the right business model and the right margins on engagements so that you can fund future content production. So for example, with the book that I'm writing, I'm writing it, but I have hired a firm to help me publish it and get it out there. For content that we create on the blog, I was able to hire a freelancer because we have margin on engagements that can be leveraged. I think consultants that struggle with this problem are not able to hire enough people to help them. And people will always be one of your biggest leverage points. So that was going to be one of my last things is building the right team around you so that the consulting is not just like a one-man shop that you know, you're at the mercy of your clients at that point because they're all pulling you in different directions with your time, right? So how do you build the right business model and the right productization to be able to find that extra funding to build and grow the business so that you're not always in the business, you're actually working on the business? Yeah, fantastic. So much more that we could dive into here, Shiv. And so we'll have to look at continue that conversation. But for today, I really want to thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing some of your story. I want to make sure that people can learn more about you and your company, check out everything that you guys have going on. Where's the best place for people to go? Uh, they can check us out on our website, www.howtosass.com, or they can follow me on LinkedIn. It's Shiv Narayanan, or uh, I think it's slash Shiv and 22 on LinkedIn. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Thanks. Uh, and again, Shiv, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com.